everyone. I'm Bo. And I'm Jamie. And this is the only show that dares ask the podcast question, hey Jamie, what you watching? Oh, I'm I am... puberty right there. Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have uh, pork chops and applesauce? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mrs. Well... Salmons. <laughs> I just dated myself with that joke. Yeah. Also, I dated you because you got it. So there's yeah. that. Um, I am very excited about this episode because yeah. I've watched some cool shit. Oh, okay. Um, I've watched some cool things. Well, that's good. But are, you start <laughs> first. The, like, I, I asked you right. first. Well, uh, the what the I'd say probably the thing I'm oh there's there's like two things that I'm equally excited about. So we will start with a more recent one, and that is fresh. Oh yeah, fresh, you, I fresh. have not <laughs> exciting. Um, <laughs> I have not had an opportunity to watch this yet, but it is on my short list. You're so okay. So I have previously talked about Pam and Tommy, and that was my introduction to Sebastian Stan. Oddly, because he's the Winter Soldier, <laughs> but yeah. I, I actually don't. I I haven't. Not even a little. I, I nothing. I I got nothing. I, when it comes to Marvel stuff, I'm very like hit or miss, and I don't, I don't see everything. So I've seen. I actually saw. What was it? The the movie Captain America versus mm -hmm. the Winter Soldier or something? Yeah, I saw that. That's the only Winter Soldier thing I have seen at all. All right. Well, and, he was in that. Yeah, and and I didn't even he didn't even didn't click. And apparently he had five seasons of Gossip Girl, which I never saw even a second of. So I just didn't know him until I watched Pam and Tommy, and I was like, oh, I really like this guy. Like he's very charming and funny, and you know just. He, uh, of course, he was portraying her character, but he's also in Fresh. And I got to say, first of all, I guess Hulu must love this guy, but um, I do too. I am a stan for Sebastian Stan now <laughs> after seeing his performance. Do you think they're called Sebastian Stan? They will be now. I just coined <laughs> another phrase. That's Hashtag Wannaverse. <laughs> uh. Uh, but uh, watch it. But, um, he's so, oh my God, like the, I'm not, I don't, I'm not going to really say anything about the film. It's just that sometimes dating doesn't go the way you think it would. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I'm not going to say why, because I don't want to spoil anything. And I recommend people go into this film knowing as little as possible because, uh, it just is far more effective that way. I think I didn't really know anything about it. I had seen a trailer once, but I wasn't really paying attention. The only thing I got from the trailer was, Oh, that's Sebastian Stan. <laughs> that's it. That's all I got. So I didn't really see what was happening in the trailer, but then uh, I heard good things about it. So I was like, Hey, let's watch this. And I was really, really, really impressed. Like it was just his performance alone. Also the lead, uh, she doesn't have, I think she only has like 12 credits. So she's not, um, she hasn't worked a whole lot, but she has this Anne Hathaway thing about her and she's just very likable. She comes across very likable. I enjoyed her and I enjoyed her playing against him and he, he just exudes charm it's it's unreal like even after you get into the movie and you know what's going on you can't help but be drawn in by him i, I even you just you can't help it it's just just i, I dare you i i, I dare right. you i dare you to go you know what i hate this guy because i just i couldn't like i'm just like oh my god i still love him like i don't know i don't know but it's it was um it's pretty weird but in the best possible way. And I just had a great time with it. The use of music in this film is phenomenal. Um, I just really enjoyed that. The energy in it is just, the, I mean, I don't know. I, I cannot recommend it any higher. Like I said, I kind of hate it that I don't want to talk more about it, but I really want to give people the chance to experience it for themselves. Um, and it's totally worth your time. Like, at least for me. I mean, you no know, people might watch it 
after hearing me go on about it and then go, what the fuck? <laughs> but, um, and that's fine. They're wrong, but that's fine. <laughs> Um, but I just, I just seriously, seriously want to get people's eyes on this film because I think it's, it's just, it's pretty great. Okay. I, it, like I said, it it is definitely on my list. There were just a, a couple of things, particularly on Shudder that I wanted to catch up with. Um, but before I get to that, so the last time that we talked on the last nine Soho episode, I kind of mm-hmm. teased a couple of movies that. I, I was going to talk about. And oh, that's one of right. Them, yeah. One of them was, and and I could be wrong about this, so you'll have to forgive me if I get this wrong, but I think this is true. But um, I think th- w- many years ago, you got me. Long, long time ago. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I also I, had a Celsius before I came. So I'm kind of hyper right now. Fair enough. <laughs> and a I shot have, of bourbon. <laughs> and, and some PCP. <laughs> and ayahuasca. And some sort of fish paralyzer. <laughs> uh, no, I watched uh, Kill Bill Volume 1 and 2. Ooh. And, which I hadn't watched in forever. And I forgot how much I love those movies. Holy crap, Jamie. I've been wanting to watch them again uh, for several months, and I haven't gotten around to it yet. But we just recently watched, uh, there's a reaction channel that we watch called Cinema Rules. By mm-hmm. the way, I highly recommend that. It's a lot of fun. And the the uh, one of the guys uh, watched Kill Bill for the first time, and it really ignited my desire to want to watch it again. Because just watching clips of it, I was like, oh my god, it's so fucking good. Yeah, it's astounding how good that movie is and <laughs> i'll tell you the the thing that has hung with me on this viewing that i really love is i don't know if you remember this scene it's a real throwaway moment kind of in the movie but it's when you're following michael madsen as bud around uh when he goes to his job as a bouncer at a strip club and when he goes in to talk to the manager or perhaps owner of this strip club he the 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 guy is in his office with one of the dancers and he's they've got cocaine on a mirror between them and to encourage her to to do some blow he says go on there honey be somebody and <laughs> i don't remember that but that's funny <laughs> it's very funny and it is really hung with me of this guy telling her to be somebody um very very good uh, so yeah, the, that blew me away. I forgot how good Uma Thurman is in the movie. I mean, it was just one of those things where, you know, watching the big, uh, fight at house of blue leaves and all of that mm-hmm. stuff. It's just, uh, you know, I, I have this experience every time I watch a Quinn Tarantino movie where I'm like, oh, well that's the best movie that Quinn Tarantino ever did. Right. And I'm that that's where I am with Kill Bill now is like, oh, as taken as a whole, that is the best thing that Quentin Tarantino ever did. But then later this month I need to watch Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And that will change my mind again because I really love that movie too. Yeah. So uh Tar- you know, there are plenty of people that like to kind of throw stones at, at Tarantino, but I, there is just no question that he is one of the best, certainly living filmmakers out there today. That when he makes a movie, it is still an event. And Look, it's the dude, so good. The dude has not even ten movies under his belt. I guess if you count Kill Bill as two, but he doesn't. So, um, and look at—I mean, he has his own genre. You know, there is a thing such as. Tar- you know, it's Tarantino-esque, you know, yeah. or it's like, I mean, not many filmmakers can make that big of an impression with so few films made over such a long period of time. I mean, he just, he just drops them when he, you know, it'll be like, oh, it's been five years. Where's my other, where's my next Tarantino movie? And he'll 
you know, throw one out and it's like, holy shit. You know, uh, I thought I'm the same as you when Inglorious Bastards came out. I was like, that's it. That's the best thing he's ever done. And then Hateful Eight came out and I'm like, nope, that's it. That's the best thing he's ever done. Right. And then Hollywood came out and I'm like, fuck me. This is my favorite movie. And then a few months ago, I, w I had the urge to go back and watch Reservoir Dogs. And I'm like, oh, no, man, <laughs> this is my favorite. And but it's it's whatever I'm watching at the time is my favorite Tarantino film. Unless it's Jackie Brown, because um, that's the one, and honestly, I need to watch it again, but that's the one that has, I, it's still good. Like, I, I don't think it's bad. It's just, it's always been at the bottom of my Tarantino list. Yeah. Um, and uh, no, everything else can kind of move around and be, you know, re-ranked and all of that, but that is always on the bottom. And... I, but I do need to watch it again and give it another day in court. I've seen it a couple times, but I just have never had the draw to that one that I've had to the other ones. But I don't know. I um I know some people who have read his book, The Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and they're just like, oh my God, it's so good. Like if you think his movie making is good, then his his writing is good too, which doesn't at all surprise me because part of the amazing bits about his filmmaking is his writing. So that I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be shocked when you know he writes a book and it's fantastic. So yeah. yeah the, and yeah, I'm with you. Like Jackie Brown is the one that I always put an asterisk beside, and I need to go back and revisit that because so many people I know and respect will tell you, "Oh, that's his best movie," and I I don't know if it's just part and parcel of like, "Oh, that's just the one you saw last," or right, um, <laughs> or or what. But yeah, it you know, and the the other thing that I I thought about as I was watching Kill Bill is that he is an easy director to imitate because you know his vibe is hey i'm gonna pull all these references from crime movies and kung fu movies and westerns and all this stuff and kind of throw it in a blender and the difference is that he has the talent to make all that work mm -hmm. because there are so many of those like especially after pulp fiction came out those movies that sort of try to ape what that movie does and what tarantino does as a writer mm -hmm. and you're just like oh this just doesn't work like you whatever whatever gift he has you don't have it and just let let him do a tarantino movie and everybody else stop because it it feels like a a pale shadow of tarantino when you're watching something like you know i, I like smoke and aces and stuff like that where, you know, maybe in a vacuum, those movies are kind of okay, but you can kind of tell, oh, this was a response to Pulp Fiction. This was the kind of movie that may was made in the wake of that one. And yeah, it's just not as good. It's just going to remind me that I should be watching Pulp Fiction. And you know what's funny is that so many people give him shit because they're like all he does is just you know he just pulls references and copies things and i'm like he's not he never lies about it he's he never says you know he's always very open with his influences and you know where he got things from and why he loves the thing he the things he loves and the the difference between someone who just outright steals things from other filmmakers and Tarantino, I think, is that not only does he do it, but he meshes these things so well and so smoothly that clearly you can see his influences, but he also obviously has talent. It's yeah. not like he's just, he he exists solely because he's pulling things from other film filmmakers. No, he's pulling things from other filmmakers and giving them his own spin, putting his own flair on it and you wouldn't be you we wouldn't have those films if anybody else tried to make them they wouldn't be the same they wouldn't be as good it just it wouldn't work it's like the ron white joke about uh hurricanes where it, it, it's not that the wind is blowing it's what the wind is blowing <laughs> you know it, it's that kind of thing where it's like it's not that he's he's making a movie that has all these references it's how he's doing it Yes. And Did I ever tell you that you remind me of Ron White? 
No, but that's not surprising. Uh, I mean, I I figured I probably would have told you at some point since we've known each other a hundred years, but it, <laughs> but you but you really do. I mean, his just his delivery and his uh, just his like one of my favorite jokes of his is where like he's at the <laughs> he's at the bar and he's got the drink ticket. And they're like, and then, oh, he gets kicked out of the bar for me. He's like, for, for being drunk or something mm-hmm. or disorderly. And then he's like, I'm not trying. He's like, I'm trying to be drunk in the bar. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm not trying to be drunk outside. I'm trying to be drunk in the bar. You put me outside. <laughs> I don't know. It's just, uh, but every time I see him, I automatically think of you. It's just, it's just a, it's like a one-to-one. I don't well, I think know. Sense it, of humor wise, the, you know. Yeah. The line preceding that one, the, the, uh, about being th- drunk in public. Um, oh, coupons. It, yeah. It, it's the, uh, um, I don't know how many people it takes to throw me out of a bar, but I knew how many they had. <laughs> Oh man! Yeah. Of all those redneck comedians, yeah, the blue collar, the blue collar guys who did the blue collar tom- comedy tour, uh, comedy tour. Uh-huh. He was always he was always my favorite. Absolutely, as, uh, yeah. He is the one comedian that was like, "Oh, you're a real stand up comic." Um, and not that the others weren't, but his wasn't just, "Hey, I've got this," you know, catchphrase. Here, yeah, or, it's not. Here's yeah. your sign, or you might be a redneck. He's just like a scotch soaked hillbilly telling yeah. stories about his family and and that stuff was very funny and like the 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 closest you came to the hey i've got a uh catchphrase was the whole tater salad thing but yeah. even that story once you get into what that story is about him oh he gets arrested and there's this alias uh and him say well you did it boys you caught the tater like that kind of shit was still funny. Um, so yeah, good for you, Ron White. Anyway, point being, I watched Kill Bill and it was really good. Um, what about you? What else have you been watching? You still plugged what? in? What happened? Um, well, I watched uh the Batman, went to the theater to see that last weekend. Oh, well, listen to you, fancy pants. How was that? I know. It was fucking great. That's what I hear. It was so good. And and I've heard this comparison um, a couple times, but not before I made it myself. Um, and it's basically, um, it's like if you took Seven mm-hmm. and Zodiac and like smashed them together and put Batman in there. That's and if someone had told me that David Fincher directed this movie, I'd go okay, yeah, I I could buy that. That sounds pretty uh, good. It's it's fucking dark. It is dark, and uh, but fantastic. And Pattinson, holy shit! Now we've already seen him do really great dramatic turns. You know, well, well, there's Lighthouse, which is great, mm-hmm. and. Uh, I don't think though that was very that was a very accessible film to the mainstream. <laughs> no, do you think two, <laughs> you think I'm two guys getting that? drunk on lamp oil, <laughs> try, trying desperately not to fuck one another? <laughs> you think I'm underplaying that? Yeah, maybe, like, <laughs> maybe. I love that movie so much, though. but yeah, go ahead. But he just he puts in a performance here that I did not expect. I, I mean, I, not that I didn't expect him to do well, because I, I assumed he would, but I just didn't expect it to be that good. And um, like the the action scenes, the fight scenes, the and like I said, it's very dark and violent. And there were a bunch of kids in the theater when I went to see it. And I was like, oh, Lord. <laughs> hey, it's Batman. Like, <laughs> but it is, I mean, it's PG-13. I think, yeah. Um, well, and and I, it's not like gratuitous or, or graphic. Like, I mean, there. It's more. Uh, I, I think it's one of those things where you'll realize how dark it is when you're if you're old enough to get it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not. Con- it's not constantly in your face with like eviscerations and stuff like that. But you realize that there's some really hairy stuff going on behind the scenes. Also, I don't want to shortchange Paul Dano, because I. 
I've always enjoyed him. The first time I saw him was, I don't remember if it was Little Miss Sunshine or There Will Be Blood. I think it was Little Miss Sunshine was the first time I remember knowing who he was. And then There Will Be Blood, he was a very, he was a standout there. I mean, and if you can stand out next to Daniel Day-Lewis, then you're doing something right. So I've, I've been a fan of him for many years and he just, it's like he watched Heath Ledger as Joker and said, hold my beer (laughs) because now I'm not saying, I'm not saying he, he just, he killed the Heath Ledger. Oh, oh, that was, that that was bad wording. I'm not, I'm not saying he overshadowed Heath Ledger's performance because that's iconic and it always will be. He was phenomenal, but he was able to bring uh, a bit of a nuance to this and he's not even in the movie all that much in comparison. So, but he has these really great dialogue moments where he just digs in. And I just was like, wow, you know, it just, the the music, the score, the music, forget Catwoman, Zoe Kravitz. Mm -hmm. I think um, she has, she's so perfect. She, perfect. (laughs) She's like, slinky like when she walks she slinks like a cat and i don't know if she walks like that all the time i haven't really paid attention but when she is but when she is in this film she slinks and she it's it's like a it's very cat-like and i was like wow that that's great like she just was perfect everything everything was perfect i cannot stress it enough I am in love with this Batman movie and this is right up there with the dark Knight for me mm-hmm. as being my two favorite Batman films of all time. And I'm actually a pretty big Batman fan, like even back to the cheesier stuff, you know, the, the, I, I, when I was a kid, I loved the old TV show and I had a huge crush on Burt Ward when I was little really? before we, before we knew that wouldn't get me anywhere, but <laughs> Yeah, I have a thing about masks. I always, I also had a huge crush on uh, the Lone Ranger and Green Hornet. Huh. <laughs> so it's like so it's, it's a very kind of, specific kind of. It's like the bandit mask. That is one how of did, them, how, and then I have other masks. How too did you feel like about the, the Hamburglar? <laughs> <laughs> so many dark nights I spent. Yeah. Sure. dreaming about the hamburger oh, i was keeping my eyes on my fries all right <laughs> but yeah <laughs> the takeaway from this is fucking fucking see the batman okay like, do yeah it, it, do i it. absolutely <laughs> i absolutely will um it's just a question of when you know it's uh yeah. it, one, one of those things like it came out at a point where it was like oh i got so much to do here's the problem with going on vacation if you're me, is that uh, you got to do a bunch of shit leading up to going on vacation to carve out the time to go on vacation. And then I'm not going to have time to see it while I'm on vacation. So Mm -hmm. uh, I'm hoping once I get back that I'm going to have like that afternoon where I can just go, you know, spend three and a half hours at the theater and watch it. So um, but I'm, I'm very excited. Like I've heard good things and I've heard it's kind of loosely based on uh, the Hush graphic novel, which is uh, a favorite of mine, and so yeah, I'm I'm excited. I, I'm it, it seems like a movie for me. Well, and this is what I loved about it too is there were very subtle nods to uh, just things that you wouldn't. I, I can't even really think of any right now because I was so in it, but like I picked up on them, and it was subtle nods to things like some of the animated films and some of the graphic novels and something, just very little things that you would pick up on. And it was like, but they don't shove it in your face. It's not, it's not like, Hey, look at what we did. No, it's just there. And if you get it, you get it. And if you don't, then no big deal, but it's, they're nice. It's nice little touches. And yeah, I just, fucking loved it i was just wow i was so engrossed and it's like three hours long and i didn't even notice like i not even a little bit like it didn't feel that long at all i didn't even have to get up and go to the bathroom which i don't think i would have even if i needed to because i wouldn't want to miss anything so yeah like like aerosmith you don't want to miss a thing 
Yeah. Are you trying to make me sing again? Is yeah. that- <laughs> well, I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to talk you out of it, if that's the question. <laughs> oh, by the way, shout yeah. out to Dan Bone uh, from Podcast on Haunted Hill, who, by the way, I love Dan. He's a sweetheart. But um, he made a comment that I have a joyful laugh. So uh, I know not everyone thinks that. So thank you, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yay! There it is. <laughs> uh, yeah, you can't tell. Is that Jamie or is that me? It's it's impossible to tell. It's what what what? <laughs> All right. So I love the Batman. Yes. Uh, what do you have next? Um, I also love the Batman. Um, no. Uh, all right. Let's talk about Ghostbusters Afterlife. Cause, oh Lord! Because here I've, we go. Yeah, we don't have to talk about this that long because my 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 opinion on the movie is much what you would expect, which is I yeah, I was afraid of that. <laughs> it, I understand why this movie exists, and I understand why people like this movie. I'm just not one of those people, and I I think the point where she pulled the wrapper, the uh, Nestle Crunch wrapper or whatever, out of the jumpsuit pocket. And the music swelled like this was supposed to be heartwarming and whatnot. And I was like, this is not the movie for me. Oh, I don't, Do you know what? I don't even remember that. <laughs> it, I remember it because I, so. Oh, I mean, I, I guess I remember it. There was I know I know this thing you're talking about. There was a bet I had with uh, my Pick Six Movies co-host and longtime friend Chad Cooper. Um, he was like, "Try," and I, I told him I was watching this. We were doing a movie night, and this was the perfect scenario for me to watch the movie because I'm going to watch it with people who are probably really going to like it. They are they're predisposed to liking this movie. And so if there's ever going to be a situation where I also like Ghostbusters Afterlife, based on the fact that I do not want a Ghostbusters movie to be heartwarming, it's going to be in a scenario where uh, I'm with people who absolutely are, are fine with that. And so I can kind of watch it through their eyes and, and enjoy it on that level. So he's, And so it didn't he, work. No, it didn't work. <laughs> so, so Chad says, okay, Pay attention and tell me the moment you would have turned the movie off had you not been with other people. And that was the moment. That was the point where I was like, oh, this throwaway joke that happens in the original Ghostbusters where Bill Murray teases Egon by saying, you, you've you earned it. and Which is a funny moment in Ghostbusters. And here, you are, you are taking a throw away off the cuff and i think it was even ad-libbed joke from bill murray and turning that moment into something that is supposed to be saccharine and i was like that's not what this movie or, that's not what ghostbusters was and it's not what i want out of a ghostbusters movie and the thing that this movie made me realize is that as much as i didn't really like the 2016 Ghostbusters with Kate McKinnon and Ugh. Melissa McCarthy. I like that more than I do this one. Ew. Because that one was at least a comedy. It wasn't though. I mean, it's not a very good comedy. I mean, it tried. Right. But, but... I would, I would rather have <laughs> I a movie. I think it was successful. I would still rather have a Ghostbusters movie try and fail to make me laugh than to not even worry about trying. You know, cause but I thought it was very funny. It there there was one joke that made me laugh, and everything else depressed me. <laughs> and and oh. by and by the time you get to the end of that movie, and they're just like, "Oh, we're just gonna do the end of the original Ghostbusters all over again," I I just couldn't care less. Uh, I and again, I know that I'm the outlier here. I know a lot of people loved it, and it you know it was a good member Mary movie of. Hey, do you remember the Ecto-1? And do you remember the P PKE reader? And do you remember the time the arms came out of the chair? And do you remember Zool? And do you remember the monster dogs? And do you remember the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man? Well, all of that is in this movie. And that's what I didn't want. 
you know like i want it to be its own thing i want it to, to be its own movie and it's just a nostalgia piece for people who really like the first ghostbusters um so anyway i like i said i we don't have to spend too much time on it i i wish that i could erase it from my brain um so that i didn't think about how they peter cushing harold ramus in that movie and made yeah, yeah. and made a gross cgi version of him uh because that was the thing where i was like god this i don't think harold ramus would want this to have been done oh uh, that's a sad thought but i mean you might be right Maybe i mean this is wouldn't. the guy who did like animal house and caddyshack and wrote national lampoon's vacation like these super irreverent comedies and to turn the like you can argue that his movie groundhog day is somewhat like there is heart in that movie for sure but there is also bill murray like throwing a toaster into a tub with himself and getting liquored up and you know reciting the jeopardy answers and staring dead-eyed at an old woman as he does it you know like that movie is kind of dark as well and and yeah and i just like anyway like i could get into a larger argument for like well every movie is just this movie now of like hey remember this thing that you liked when you were a kid or hey wouldn't it be great to take your kids to a movie that's exactly like the movie not the not like the movie you saw but it's like what you remember the movie you saw was because yeah. it, you know anyway i i just i nostalgia is poisonous and it has absolutely infected this culture so that nothing you have to go out of your way to to find new stuff like the hollywood studio system just is never going to give you a new idea anymore because it's too up its own ass recycling the stuff from 20 or 30 or 40 years ago and um <laughs> i heard someone the other day say there has not been true american culture since the year 2000 and i don't know that that's wrong hmm, uh, i'd actually have to put some thought into it but i could be right right i mean everything else is just like re recycling and revamping ideas from prior to that date not everything and i don't mean like the obscure weird stuff that we watch but i'm saying like if you went to a movie theater like even the batman as good as the batman is it's still a riff on the batman and well, true you know and i like that is not to say that the movie is is bad i mean i i expect that it's going to be very good but it's not like this whole cloth original idea it is a a spin on a previous idea yeah um so that and that's the thing is like i just i wish there were I, I, somebody i heard today uh say that in i think it was like 1992 the number one movie in the country uh for a, sometime in october was um the fisher king and i was like man imagine a world where the Fisher King was released today and it was the number one movie in America. And I just don't think we live in that world anymore. Um, that's what I'm nostalgic for is weird ass Terry Killian movies being number one at the box office, Jamie. Yeah. Well, and that's a very good movie, it's, <laughs> but Oh, it's good. Yeah. I had this, we, Brian and I actually had a similar conversation when we went to see the cursed and it was, which by the way, I also recommend mm -hmm. uh, that was very cool. Uh, just it's a period piece and it's the kind of movie that unfortunately it's very good, but it's unfortunate that, you know, it's not going to get a big box office draw. It's just not, yeah, yeah, it yeah. just doesn't have box office baked into it. And it's a shame because I would love to live in a world where a, a film like that, a, a period piece sort of werewolf flick could, you know, really do well. But uh, I don't think thing, I mean, like something like the night house, which I was yeah. totally in love with. And I, I, you know, those just, those movies might be really, really good. Uh, excellent even, but 
it's just not, that's not what the mainstream is about these days. And they're not, and I don't think that overall the mainstream is that experimental. You know, I, I think that on the whole, the, on like on the big whole, people like seeing what they are comfortable and familiar with. Yeah. Not since and, the, you know, like the seventies is probably the last time in terms of filmmaking uh, but that's also coming out of the 60s. Like, in you know, the 70s were a response to the really terrible... And I, I, my fingers are crossed that we're going to get that again. Because, like, the 60s were kind of littered with all the beach blanket bingo kind of shit. And westerns yeah. and stuff like that. And then the 70s came along and you got, you know, Serpico and The Godfather and Apocalypse Now and uh, Jaws. And all these movies that were really the exorcist the and ex texas chainsaw and uh, right which is not you know really mainstream either but the exorcist was yeah you know yeah exactly or, or the conversation or the french connection mm -hmm. or you know like there are all these movies that you know uh de palma's blowout you know all these movies that i just watched that recently oh, again because so uh, brian got me the criterion mm. and it was just a gift out of nowhere just a hey i got you something I'm like, oh, what? And he hands it to me. And I'm like, what? You know, because <laughs> that's one of my favorite De Palma films. So uh, I was really excited to watch that. And holy shit, that movie's good. It's a good scream. It's a good scream. Uh, yeah. Oh, oh God. And it's that so tears good. my heart out yeah. at the end. Oh, my God. Oh, that movie is so uh, good. Yeah, but right. Uh, but so that stuff came out of a, a really stagnant period of filmmaking. And I'm kind of hoping that that's where we are is that, you know, that eventually audiences are going to get to the point where they're like, I don't want to go back to the theater and see another Spider-Man movie. As much as I love that last Spider-Man movie, I'm yeah, totally that fine. Was, that was good shit. Yeah. But I'm also <laughs> totally fine with, with cinema going in entirely different direction. And but I, maybe that's just what streaming services are at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, anyway, enough, enough of my old man shaking my fist at the clouds. Uh, what about you? What else have you been watching? So it's, this is actually kind of funny because you just mentioned Westerns. And I think I have brought up in the past that we, if I haven't, then I am bringing it up now, that we have instituted Fun Friday. Mm -hmm. And that is where each of us bring something to the table and that no pants just for fun. Yeah. Usually not. Um, and so it'll be like just random thing. The only, the only caveat for fun Friday is that it cannot be a horror film. And that's not because I'm sick of watching horror. It's just because we mostly watch horror. And so we purposely on fun Friday pick films that are not because that kind of gives us the opportunity to watch things that we love and haven't seen in a long time. So like, for instance, this past Friday, um, Brian picked hot fuzz and I picked role models. And so, and he had never seen role models before and he thought it was very funny. And then I re remembered I was, as I was watching the movie, I'm like, Oh my God, this is so inappropriate, <laughs> yeah. but in a fantastic fucking way, it's hilarious, but it's very inappropriate. I mean, Sean William Scott talks about dicks way too much with this little kid, <laughs> but you know, um, back then very different. Uh, uh, we had a very different, you know, face of comedy in the 2000s um and i kind of miss it because i i love how just ridiculously irreverent it was but uh anyway on top of that brian was like i want to watch uh the outlaw josie wales Ooh. and i was like all right now we're doing western wednesdays <laughs> because i love westerns and he loves westerns and so we did watch outlaw josie wales um but my pick <laughs> was I'm a huge John Ford fan. Mm -hmm. So my pick was the searchers. And so last night we watched the searchers and, uh, I just, Oh my God, that is a beautiful movie. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he, he, some of the, and it's, I made a joke like toward the bit, kind of in the beginning. And I was just, and this is a movie that I know really well. Cause I watched it a lot when I was growing up, but I was like, he really loves his doorway shots in this movie. And he does like he begins the movie with a door, a shot through a doorway. He ends it with a shot through a doorway and there's a whole bunch more mixed in. He just has this thing about 
framing the darkness of the inside against the brightness of the desert outside and all the sun and the sky and everything. And it, it looks beautiful though. I don't blame him. I mean, it looks amazing. Um, and I was just, and I started crying like probably five minutes in and Brian's like, are you okay? What's wrong? And I'm like, oh, just thinking about the end. <laughs> 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 but I also had a, a big thing for John Wayne when I was a kid. He was my boyfriend. I was, I was such a random child, uh -huh. but uh, I had this wooden John Wayne clock on my wall on my wall when i'm talking i was like 12 and i just was so in love with him <laughs> that's I was very so strange. weird i know it's so weird but the thing is it also reminds me of daddy because um we would even after i moved out you know went to college and got my own place and all of that Every time I would come visit him, it would be on a weekend. And every time I would come visit him, there would be a Western on TV. And it would typically be a John Wayne movie. And so we got to, we, I watched him with him all the time when I was growing up. And then as I got older and I'd come visit him, we'd still watch John Wayne movies together just because they would be on TNT or whatever he was watching. And so it's always been very special to me because of that, you know. Kind of like that Wizard of Oz story that I told that made me cry in that one episode <laughs> mm -hmm. where we were, that 1824 episode. It's, he was a, such an important. Yeah. Well, my dad was like that too. Life. Yeah. He, I mean, he was just everything to me. The only. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I, I, <laughs> I, no, I'm, I'm just agreeing with you. Like, it is hard, I think, for people who didn't grow up in in the 80s to understand how like eponymous john wayne was even though like by the time i was aware of john wayne he wasn't acting anymore he might have even been dead for all i know but it, like the impact he had on movies like every movie that came on saturday afternoons was a john yeah. wayne movie yes and, and they're long if it's a john ford movie they're long so it takes yeah. up you know a lot of the afternoon but um just so many of them you know um sons of katie elder the um man who shot liberty uh, balance the man uh, is, is terrific movie the shootus um oh my god yeah. yes true grit um, yeah, yeah, yeah like i i had to learn to separate the fact that my initial feeling about john wayne was well that is just the actor that my dad likes and then once I got past that and started thinking like, oh, John Wayne is legitimately, I, I don't know that he's a great actor, but he is a movie star, you know? Yeah. And it's, yeah. So. And you could even argue that, and, I, and I've heard it argued that he basically plays the same character in every movie. And in a lot of the movies, he's wearing the same stuff. Like he basically sure. had a uniform, yeah. you know, that he would wear, but it was there was comfort in that and the movie and like especially the john ford films they can be very dark um it, not in your face because this is a time when they weren't gonna outright um it's not like pale rider or something you know it, they, these are in the 50s it's not they weren't in your face with the darkness but it was alluded to and there's a scene in the searchers where um Okay, there is a there is a massacre, and two of the young girls, two two of his nieces, are kidnapped by this rogue tribe of Comanches, and it's they they are rogue. They're they are evil, and, and it's not. Um, it, 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 that's what I actually like about this film is they don't portray Native Americans as evil across the board. Mm -hmm. There is a specific group who are just murder party. Like this one guy just murders people. And and you find out toward the end that he actually, he his mind is on revenge because his family was killed by white people. So he just goes on these murder raids and for years, like stretches of years, he's just murdering people and kidnapping young girls. And they, they go out searching for them. That's why it's called the searchers. And at one point they come across the older one and he actually goes off on it. John Wayne actually goes off on his own. Her boyfriend is 
part of his search party and then also the um a boy that had been taken in by their this family who was kind of like the brother of the two girls and john wayne goes off at one point and he finds her in a canyon and you don't see it uh you just he comes back and they're like hey where's your coat and he's like oh i guess he's like i i guess i dropped it i'm not going back for it and then later on in the film the boyfriend of this girl is like they, they find the the party and they're like oh he's like i saw her i saw her she's alive she was wearing the same blue dress and he's like that's not her and he's like yes it is and he's like it's not her mm -hmm. that is a man wearing her dress but i guarantee you it's not her she's dead He's like, I wasn't going to tell you this, but I found her in the canyon and I wrapped her in my coat and I buried her. And he's like, and the guy's like, well, was she, was she, did they, what, and you know what he's, yeah, yeah. you know what he's going for, but nobody ever says it. And, and then he just, John Wayne has this moment where he's just like, what do you want me to do? Draw you a picture? Never ask me about it. As long as you live, never ask me about that again. And I'm just like, oh God. And you know exactly what they're talking about. And you know what's going on in this scene, but no one says it, but they don't have to. Yeah. And I was just like, oh shit. Like, <laughs> it's just, I don't know. I just think it's very powerful. And um, it's a it's a very emotional film, but it's also a very goofy film because John Wayne had, John Wayne, John Ford had a, um, a really quirky sense of humor. So he he intersperses the darkness. I mean, we're talking about, you know, murder and rape and scalping and, and just like all of this stuff. And he, in, he like weaves in these really off the wall comedic parts that just kind of, uh, kind of balance it out. And Brian doesn't, he didn't really care for that part of it. He's just like, well, that's too cheesy or, you know, too goofy. And I'm like, no, I was like, yeah, think about when it's made and think about like this movie is dark like it really is even though they don't outright say some of the things that they're alluding to you're an adult you get it like you know it's it's fucking it's dark shit so it only makes sense that he would try to lighten the mood a little bit here and there and it also kind of endears you to the characters now i can understand if somebody doesn't get anything out of that or if they think it's too you, it, maybe it's too much of a tonal shift and it doesn't, it just doesn't work for them. Like, that's fine. But for me, and maybe it's because I grew up on it, but for me, I, I love those parts, you know, and what I found, and I haven't watched that movie in probably 15 years at least. And I knew every musical cue still. I knew the lines, like I knew I was waiting for things to happen that I knew were going to happen. So it definitely has an impact on me. And, um, and yeah, and anyway, that, so that was, uh, that was my pick. And then of course we also watched the outlaw Josie Wales, which is just, that's a totally different kind of dark. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. That, that's a far more like popcorn kind of Western movie, but, um, I'll, I'll never in my life forget the, the scene where they're on the, uh, the ferry. And the mm -hmm. snake oil salesman is this good for this and this and this. And Josie spits on his white suit and says, "How's it on stage?" Yes. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, it is so good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know what I found? It's funny because I'm a very John Ford. Like I lean more toward the John Ford westerns. Brian leans more toward the the Sergio, and. It's, and we both like both, like we both love them both, but it's just kind of funny that, you know, cause they're very different and they have different, and you know, Clint Eastwood and John Wayne are two very different people with very different things that they bring to the table. But yeah, that scene in Josie Wales where they discover that, or when they realize that it's a trap in the very beginning, um, that, you know, they thought they were going, they were turning themselves mm -hmm. in, it was going to be, you know, and then you realize what's happening. And it's oh, <laughs> yeah. just holy shit. <laughs> it's just damn. But that's a really, really, really good movie too. So anyway, so yeah, from now on we're doing, at least for now, we're going to be doing some Western Wednesday, Wednesdays. And I'm looking forward to it because I love Westerns. Yeah, I, really I, do. I do too. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a sucker for a good Western. I keep meaning to go back and watch Pale Rider. 
that is one that I've been meaning to watch again for some time. We watched that after not too long ago. Well, it's been a couple of years, but it was after um, Brimstone. Um, Cause we actually got into this whole conversation about how, you know, whether or not Brimstone was a horror film. And I was like, um, and Brian and I, we we're both on the same page with this. We don't think it is like, to me, it's just a Western, mm-hmm. you know, and people are like, but it's so dark. And I'm like, yeah. Have you seen Westerns? They're fucking dark. You know, yeah, right, you've got right. things like pale writer and just because it has a supernatural aspect to it doesn't make it a horror film either. Just because you look at something again, like pale writer and, um, What's the other movie? It's the same movie, basically. Uh, it's Clint Eastwood, but it's pretty much the same story. Um, I can't think of the name of it. But uh, I think that's going to be coming up next, probably, um, as one of like Brian's picks. And I've been kind of itching to watch Sons of Katie Elder again. So, yeah, I don't know. that's a good movie. But, you know, there was a thing in the 70s and the 80s, particularly the early 80s. We, you know, we had things like Little House on the Prairie, and um, then, of course, um, or at least in my house, we were watching reruns of things like um, The Rifleman or Bonanza, or, you know, it was just, there There was a lot of Western stuff going on around that time. And then, like, one of my favorite ever miniseries is Centennial. Um, oh, wow, yeah. Yeah, I, oh, I haven't thought about that in a while. Yeah, a I actually... Deal. Yeah, um, I actually have that on DVD now. And when I first moved up here, Brian had never seen it and I showed it to him. And then we loaned it to his mother and she's just, she was in, totally in love. Like, it's just, it's so good. And it's, it just, I love how it spans so much time. And it, uh, anyway, now I got to watch that again. But anyway, so sorry, I didn't mean to drag on so long, but yeah. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, real quick, because we are rapidly running out of time here on this episode Fuck. i know i feel like it went by so fast it has uh all right here's one i watched that w- is relatively new to shutter um and is a movie called hellbender i just watched a review of that today and i really want to see it i really liked hellbender uh i don't think it is a, you know, a perfect movie by any stretch but it's such a great spin on the idea of witches and witchcraft and um it like i like a good witch movie you know going back to the craft like i I love the craft and this has a little hint of a dark song as well okay where it's like okay well here's the ritual part of doing the witchcraft stuff and here's why you don't want to do too much of it and you know, uh, here's why. Uh, so the premise if, if, for for people who don't know, the idea is that this young girl is uh, she's a teenager. Her mother um, keeps her uh, away from pretty much everyone else out in the middle of the woods in this house. They have a band together, which has some pretty rocking songs. And uh, and there's a little bit of a rock vibe to this movie as well, which I really like. And the big secret of the movie is, oh, by the way, we're both witches. And the reason that I'm keeping you away from people is that we live a long time. Also, if you don't know what you're doing, you can end up hurting people because you are possessed of a a great deal of power. And if you don't know how to use it, you can really fuck somebody up. And so the movie is this girl, you know, kind of coming of age and, you know, doing what teenage girls do, uh, or teenagers in general, which is to test the boundaries of, uh, what is allowed and what is not allowed. And, and she wants to have friends. And, you know, the problem is that if you have friends, that means you're going to have experiences that you're not prepared for. And what does that do to you when you have a tremendous amount of power that can, Again, really fuck somebody up if you're not careful. And it's very, uh, it's very interesting. It's got a great pace to it. Um, it's low budget for, for sure, but it makes use of every dollar that's spent on the film. So I really, really liked it. 
Um, I, th- nice. I think it's a, a, a terrific, like, indie horror movie. Um, and I don't think that we get nearly any, like, Shudder is real good about bringing stuff to Shudder. Um, you know, not to be counter uh, factual here, but, um, but they also just drop like that movie, the seed. And that is a movie that is kind of an indie horror film as well. And it looks like it has all the ingredients of a movie that you would want to watch, but it doesn't. It turns oh. out that that movie is not very good. Um, but then you have something like hellbender and hellbender was a delight. It was really terrific so you know i again hats off to shutter for sometimes they miss but when they hit boy uh it makes me awfully glad i have that service and that it exists and that it brings movies like hellbender to the front and center and they've been pushing that movie quite a bit i feel like they know what they've got on their hands with that one um and there's a real strong chance like when it comes time to put my top 10 list together at the end of the year hellbender is definitely a candidate that that was wow yeah that's how well that's how i feel about fresh honestly yeah i and i will see that soon so uh and i'm excited to see hellbender because i wanted to see it anyway but now that it has your stamp of approval that just gives me confidence it's really not only is it just a good movie it's just kind of cool and i like a horror movie that's also kind of cool um, like the, the main character of the girl is a drummer and, and maybe it's because back in my high school days, I dated a girl who was a drummer, but I've always thought that was kind of fun and sexy. So, uh, seeing her and her mom just do this two piece band outfit. Uh, I, I really dig it's good. It's good. Hellbender is a good movie. Um, yeah. Uh, give me one more before we get out of here. Okay. I don't think I've talked about studio six, six, six. No, you haven't. Okay. That, yeah, we went to see that. Uh-huh. And I was really looking forward to that because, one, I'm a big Foo Fighters fan. Mm-hmm. Um, I honestly think the Foo Fighters was the best thing to come out of Nirvana. <laughs> like, I was never Just a Nirvana fan. Bite but your I, tongue. <laughs> I was never a Nirvana fan, but I love Foo Fighters. And um, I was like, oh, you know, it, look, it looked, you know, funny and, and charming and whatever. And it was like, I had a really good time with it. It was very fun. The, any drawbacks that it had, I think can be just chalked up to the fact that these guys are not actors. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so some of the humor didn't exactly land like it should have, or like y- you would think it would, at least for me, um, Brian, I think liked it more than I did, but, uh, but it still was there and these guys are great. They have a really good chemistry with each other because they've been together for so long. And it just, it was, it was really fun. They did some, they did several nods to things, uh, just various things from horror that I thought was great. And it's, it doesn't have like a deep meaning or anything. It's not, it's not like a spiritual awakening of any kind. It's just fun. And it's the gore is fantastic <laughs> like it's oh, just okay. it's, it's got some really great gore and uh yeah it was it, it was pretty good i had a good time with it i i've kind of heard that at the very least with that movie that it does have like it doesn't shrink away from showing some blood no no That's it doesn't good. and uh i mean they were talking like scenes like shit spraying everywhere <laughs> and i'm like oh yay like it just was it was embraced you know they just fully embraced it and also the, a really cool cameo uh, from carpenter i no mean kidding. now now i knew going in that he uh sort of contributed to the score uh he just wanted to yeah and i i thought that was really cool but i didn't know he was actually in the film and he it's a very small part and it's just a cameo but it's longer than like he doesn't just pop his head around the door go hello and then pop back out it's longer than that but it's not you know like a seminal part of the film but it it's really nice to see him there you know it's comforting to I, yeah. see him there it's it's like oh you know so yeah it, it was it was really great i just it was fun i had fun i had no idea that john carpenter had anything to do with that movie yeah, it's uh, and the you can hear it in the score too, and it's cool. That's it's very cool. That's awesome. Um, all right, well, 
that's gonna do it for this episode of what you're watching uh you know unsurprisingly there were some tangents in there i make no apologies uh, yeah for i mean they, sometimes we talk about you know 17 movies sometimes we talk about four it just depends on where uh where we you know jump off and start talking about some bullshit but. yeah we got a solid half dozen seven movies in there i'm proud of us all um, right. but hey uh thanks everybody for for listening to uh to us wax nostalgic about uh movies and particularly so somewhat off the beaten path going into westerns and whatnot uh but you know we might you know, we need to do something with a western one day I don't you know, know what I have I have had the idea for a Western podcast kicking around in my brain for like a decade. It's all I've always wanted to do like a Western side project. Yeah. And I just haven't done it. Um, but we, yeah, yeah, they're we that might, important to me. You and I might just need to do like a commentary track for like Outlaw Josie Wales or something. Oh, that'd be cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, we'll see what people say. But anyway, uh, thanks everybody for listening. We'll be back in a month's time uh, for more What You're Watching. Until then, uh, say goodnight there, Jamie. Good night, Pilgrim. Good night, Pilgrim. Oh, that was so bad. I should have just <laughs> shut up and let you handle it because mine was good no <laughs> yeah but yours That's was worse than mine. yours Jimmy was more Stewart. charming <laughs>